So, my name is Samuel Lampa. I, I'm a PhD student at uh, Farm Bio, pharmaceutical bio, uh, in pharmaceutical bioinformatics. So, I sit in the far corner of BMC over there. Uh, and I will, yeah, you see the title, I, I will talk a little bit about how I think that like data science and big data uh, can come together with the world of linked data and semantic web and so on. And uh, the reason I'm talking about this is that these two fields are actually what I'm, uh, what I'm working on. I started with semantic web stuff in my master's thesis like 10 years ago. And then I left it and have been doing like data science and data pipelines and stuff for since that. And uh, now it seems like this, maybe the technologies have improved a little bit and yeah, we'll see what, what, what's, the, what's the answer to this uh, question. Uh, so I have this more detailed title uh, that says a little bit more uh, the names of some technologies here. Um, so anyway, to, to start off the scene and kind of uh, put out the problem or one problem I think I have seen and I will warn in beforehand that this talk is it's quite much like personal opinion and my personal view and so on so you're very much free to chime in with your view afterwards and so on but I'll try to kind of give my perspective or my view from my perspective on this as I und have understood it and as my impression of, of what has happened during the last 10 years have been that that uh, the semantic web it started before the big data era and so not the technologies uh, that it ba was based on was not always very maybe not yeah adapted to these terabytes of data and so on so the idea is very much inspired from the web that we have we have uh, distributed the information is di distributed over the web and then we have a user who is clicking and kind of interactively uh, navigating. Of course, we have the idea of machine readability on, on top of that, of course, but still it's kind of uh, the information is spread out and then of course it's not easy to work with terabytes of data if it's spread out all over the world. Uh, so then we have on the opposite side we have had data science and, and especially big data where yeah, maybe as you saw in, in Johan Rung's presentation, the data, the data amounts are really just huge. And you can't, you can't build on, on strategies that involve shuffling around data. You need to keep things together and kind of shuffling it around locally as much as possible. So this is what I've tried to, to visualize here with, yeah, like some data processing and getting that into a nice kind of yeah, more high li level data set and, and then doing visualizations and stuff. So it's a, more, a bit more like hands on, getting your hands dirty and messing around with data. Uh, and another thing uh, we, with the semantic web is that typically you work with data that is already published. So you kind of consume data and it, it's not it doesn't come very easy to you, like how do I mess around with data and try different ways of modeling the data and so on. That hasn't came very natural from the start, I would say. Um, so, any solution to this? Uh, just uh, in text a few, a few more of the things that I al already mentioned, like the data is distributed and so on. Also, a lot of technology, yeah, I won't say more about this right now. <clears throat> uh, so a few more of the things that I think have been challenging or added challenging, challenges to kind of working hands-on with data in the semantic web has been that, um, like the tools perhaps have not been that developed and also like since everything is spread out without the one common schema it, it's you kind of if you start working with sparkle for example to kind of query your data you easily get tons of really large sparkle queries which are kind of one-off queries 
you can't, I mean, what you want is to kind of build up uh, some structure in this. In, in typical data science, perhaps you, you extract some data and then you have a nicer data set and you continue with that and so on. So I think something like that is, is needed. And then Sparkle, I don't think it perhaps has everything what is needed there. Basically what you would want, want is Sparkle and put a name on a query so that you can use this name and refer to it later as a concept or something. I'll come into that. So personally, I've been always very interested in, in Prolog and this is a bit controversial, but I think it's really nice because it has these named rules. Like you can, you can have a relation which you call grandparent, which is built up by other rules like parent, for example, and here we have the parent relationship up here. And uh, actually, it's very similar to Sparkle, actually. You, if you see this as a subject, and this is the predicate, and this is as the object. Um, yeah. And also, especially SVI, SWI Prolog has a very nice uh, semantic web integration. And you can kind of, I mean, you can create these rules, and you can, you can query Sparkle here inside the rule. Uh, also external Sparkle endpoints and so on, and, and, and put a name on it, and then reuse that in other queries. So you can kind of build up a vocabulary um, so that you can get more expressiveness and know what you're doing. Um, so this is something, this is a, a direction I've been a fan of since the start, basically. So I'll, I'll mention quickly some things we did with, with this. Uh, in my master's thesis project, I integrated uh, the SWI's Prolog in, into Bioclips, which is a, it's a graphical workbench for, for bioinformatics and cheminformatics, which is developed in, in the group, in our research group. Um, so, yeah, and, and our experiences from that is the querying is nice and so on. The, the main problem with, with Prolog and especially SWI Prolog is that uh, it does only store things in memory. Uh, so it, it's not suited for really large data sets. Um, something else we did while trying to kind of make it easy, easier to mess around with data for normal users is to, uh, to integrate or, or to make it possible to import semantic data into semantic media wiki. I don't know, I guess everybody knows about Wikipedia. Um, Semantic v Media Wiki is not that well known, but Wikipedia is well known. And Wikipedia is powered by a software called Media Wiki. And Media Wiki, there's some, some extensions to that, that so that you can put in semantic uh, data into Wiki in a very, <coughs> very nice and easy textual format. So we made a plugin that so that you can import RDF in a various, a lot of different ways, and uh, through some common code and get it into into MediaWiki. So what it looks like is you kind of have your own local Wikipedia, and uh, and the semantic MediaWiki is, is really nice because it has a lot of really nice features for like creating templates for formatting data really nicely and so on. So. This screenshot, this screenshot is from, from a data set that we imported that was just some plain uh, bioinformatics data. Then we imported it and then cr just created some templates. And then we just create the template once and then all the, all the things that in the wiki will be presented in this nice way. So it was kind of one way of one way of being able to view the data in a user-friendly way. I mean, here we can click around. And then since it's a wiki, anybody can go in and edit and change the data and have everything stored in history and so on. And we can collaboratively uh, work on the data. And then we can export it into, into semantic RDF format again afterwards. Uh, there's a Sparkle endpoint for getting the data out and so on. And actually, to, to link it to the Prolog world, here is a prolog query, uh, querying this wiki, actually, with a Sparkle query. So that is also possible. 
Uh, so I'm coming towards the end of the talk and that was some things we did but today I would say now when I'm coming back after many years of uh, data pipelines and stuff now I've been starting to look a little bit into linked data again and I see that the field has progressed <laughs> uh, luckily during these 10 years and uh, there is uh, some very promising solutions I think or technologies and stuff for which are actually they support working with pretty large data sets and I think I think one of the things uh, that has uh, became clearer over the years is that to work with really large data sets you have to be able to get data into into your local computer or computer data center or something and mess around with it there so the, these two tools which I which I mentioned here are uh, are supporting it in, in that way and uh, the first one is blaze graph which is just it's a triple store uh, but it's very fast you can take a really large uh, file in in some RDF format just drop it in the web interface and it will import it in seconds and then you can sparkle and stuff it's it's very very slick to work with uh, triple stores as a concept is pretty known already so I, I won't say too much about it uh, more. I will tell a little bit more about RDF HDT which is a newer thing. Uh, it's a newer thing and pretty bleeding edge actually. So, but it, it's very promising I think. And this is a this is a binary format for storing for storing RDF data. HDT stands for header dictionary triples. So the idea here is that we have some metadata about the storage, then we have an index, which, which is called a directory. Uh, and then we have the actual data, the triples, and everything is binary. And because we have the index, we, kind of, we can do search, because we have the index separately, we can do very fast search operations on the, on the data without actually needing to read through the whole file. So, we have, for example, a 12 gigabyte file with 90 million triples or something, and, and we can do the run the command line tools and get queries in, yeah, at least at the blink of an eye, we can see. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I took s told some of this already. Uh, base graph. HDT and w what is nice with HDT in relation to the powerful querying which I mentioned before is that SWI Prolog supports it very nicely. It has a plugin for that. So uh, maybe the main the main concern with it is, is that it's quite new and bleeding edge and so on, and uh, also that if you need to turn data into this format that is kind of a heavy, heavy operation right now. So it, it's not like with a triple store you can kind of write and read more, more fluently. Oh, by the way, I should mention that of course you can, you can connect to, the, to Blaze Graph through Prolog as well. Uh, anyway, a uh, quick summary of to, to kind of describe why RDF HDT is needed if we look at the typical way to store it store semantic data as a file which would be XML or turtle or notation tree that's very in inefficient especially the XML and perhaps especially the entry format uh, since like 90 billion triples that's I don't know it's uh, hundreds of gigabytes I think um, and also if you need to do some operations on it you need to do really large scans through the whole file if you, give, if you zip it, it will be compact, but then of course it's even slower to search. Uh, but with, with RDF HTT, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get a really compact format that you can also search really fast. So I, I really like that. I don't have much time left. Uh, I don't have many slides left either. Uh, I should just mention that uh, there's a big use case for which is using RDF HDT, which I, I can recommend to check out. 
It's called LOD Laundromat. And LOD stands for something like the linked open data cloud, something. So they basically took the whole linked data cloud, cleaned it up a little bit, and put it down, down into one data set. So that is really something to play around with if you have too little to do tonight. Um, uh, lastly, uh, something we did with RDF HDT already in, in a recent paper that just the last week came out is we made a small uh, URI resolver, um, which is, yeah, it, we had quite a large data set. It was a 12 gigabyte file or something, and we didn't, yeah, it's, it seemed like a good use case for RDF HDT. Uh, so, in the future, my vision is to use Prolog more and more, SVI, SWA Prolog. It, it's, it has also developed quite a bit and it has these nice notebook, notebooks that you can use in addition to command lines and stuff. And then kind of, because I think that can be a nice integration layer for all kinds of data sources since you build up your queries and, and, and stuff. That's my vision at least. Um, so, before I come to the concluding slide, uh, I want to say this uh, quote by Tim Berners-Lee, which he reportedly he has said it multiple times at, at recent talks, that linked data is the semantic web done right. So I think it basically reflects that the field has kind of matured a little bit, and also now rebranded itself a little bit. So, I'll end with this slide. I think I have like three minutes for questions, or is that right? Or? Yes, that is right. More great. Do you know anything about the current status of Blaze Graph? Uh, not sure. I mean, I tried it out and it worked great. Yeah, because Amazon hired basically all of the engineers, and then they launched Amazon Neptune, and since then there was no development of Blaze Graph anymore. And then I'm just that's wondering whether that sounds a bit worrisome. Yeah, that sounds worrisome. I mean, it's open source and also it's used by Wikidata, yeah. which is a really major project. So I hope that there will be some incentives to put in maintenance of it. But I, I, I haven't heard about that yet. Yeah. Because I couldn't find any information about it, so I thought that perhaps you know. Right. Let's hope for the best. <laughs> right. of data like in connect, uh, content delivery networks uh, or like why should there be copies all over the internet like can you make a solution where you have if you have one resource for example a javascript file like and it's that one uri like uh, that's a good question that's a good question do you think about like individual resources or yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're not thinking about the data sets. No, I think about yeah. resources. That's a good question. I, I, I guess it's something that can the data publishers can think about. Like, and I, I'm not so good, very skilled in, in, in that. Yeah. Maybe I can <coughs> say, so this is actually one of the very contentious issues in linked data. This is one of the things that is hard to, for people who don't do linked data to understand. There is a long or very old principle coming from Semantic Web called AAA, uh, which basically says that anyone can say anything um, about anything anywhere. So <coughs> if there is a Wikipedia article, for example, about Marie Curie Skłodowska, um, and it says something about her, um, linked data fundamentally forbids you from assuming that that is the only place on the web that says something about her. You must assume, or at least you should assume, uh, that there could be other places on the web also saying some information about it. And this is fundamentally why it's a little bit hard to do what you're asking. But true, uh, it's, it's problematic as 
uh, the data science yeah. point. I I think what what Wikidata has done with like <coughs> gathering data is that they they allow multiple conflicting data, Sorry. multiple conflicting data points, but they store the provenance information about where it comes from and so on. Yes, a comment. Um. So it's also this open world assumption, you can't know everything. Uh, I think that in each case uh, it's possible yeah. to... Wait, take this one. Yeah. Uh, it's possible to, to close the world. It's just that you have to decide which sources to include. And I think this connects also to Samuel's first uh, reflection that it wasn't really mature and it's distributed and everything. And I think that's... Um, Yes, that's a valid point. Everything is distributed. And, but on the other hand, it uses HTTP. You can fetch it, you can cache it, you can do whatever you want with it. So one way is to actually have a cache, which we, we did one a couple of years back. Hannes did implement a, a, a linked data cache that given a certain set of starting points, it can retrieve information and have this local graph where you can play around with it. So I think that there is just um, there is a need or maybe you would have needed this kind of cache software to make things local, to make it easier to start playing around with. At least that's one of the problems you mentioned. Right, okay. But, but getting the cache in an interactive fashion wouldn't be practical, I think, if you have terabytes of data. No, no. You, in, the, in this case, it, the, the cache is not interactive. It's more like you configure it, say, like, these are the sources, these are the relations you'd follow. Try this many times before you give up, and then you build up your... Uh, you close your world. You you fetch your data that you can. That would be really cool. Yeah. yeah, I will send you a pointer.